Monday Mayhem is a, uh, uh, a programming we do every, every first Monday of the month. Um, we're still working on something for next month. It may be something with power. It may be something with the Fight for 15 campaign. Um, or we may do a film out on the, the wall of the building, which would be kind of fun, too. We've done that in the past. Um, yeah, yeah. The idea of Monday Mayhem is that, you know, when we started the Flying Scroll, we had meetings every single Monday for about five years before, like three years before, two years after we got the building. But we were really focused on, when we got the building, we were very focused on nuts and bolts kinds of things. So we really wanted to sort of broaden our discussion away from just the day-to-day -day and think more about how our space here, um, you know, how it relates to the space around us, our communities, how these issues of like drone warfare relate to what we're doing on the ground and how we can have an effect on those things and how can the flying squirrel be a part of that change that's happening. Um, I also want to just take a second and recognize that this space and this city are on um, contested um, Seneca lands, uh, indigenous territory um, that, you know, uh, New York State and the federal government have not followed through with their agreements with treaties and have really uh, colonized and taken advantage of indigenous people. So I wanted to make that um, aware. Um, Al Brundage is doing videography tonight. Uh, thank you, Al. It's going to be on Rochester Indie Media, so if you'd like to uh, share this talk and discussion with others, please do. And I'm assuming it will get up in a week or so. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so finally, uh, Harry Murray, uh, peace activist, civil disobedient person extraordinaire, uh, Nazareth, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, professor, professor. professor yeah. um, uh, I met Harry a while ago, probably at St. Joe's, when I was doing Food Not Bombs, and yeah. Uh, yeah. just a very kind, very sweet man, and I'm um, really happy he was able to come out tonight and be present. So, Harry, if you want to give a little bit more of a bio, I don't have much in front of me, but if, you, don't, if you feel like that's good enough, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's more, more than enough said. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, Harry Murray. All right. Okay, well, it's good to, good to be among friends here, so... And thanks, thanks for asking me. Um, this is sort uh, this started off as sort of a rerun of, of a talk that I gave at St. John Fisher um, a couple months ago. Um, but it's it's and, and and that was more of a kind of a formal lecture. So I'll, I'll you know I've, I've got the framework for that if we want, but we can also you know have it be much more of a discussion. Um, it's also evolved, I think, because because of the audience. At Fisher, I was um, talking to a lot of college students who were there because they were forced to come and knew nothing about drones. And, and then people who were coming out of the Catholic tradition and sort of trying to convince uh, convince them that drones are worth um, worth worrying about. Here, you know, obviously, you've got it group of committed activists that uh, I'll just try to lay out what the issues are with drones and make the case that with all the other things going on, all of the other issues, that, that they are important. Um, in, in some ways, um, that was done much better than I could um, two months ago in Syracuse by Cornell West, who gave uh, just a, a brilliant talk on connecting the dots, racism, poverty, and drones. Um, and, and I hope at least in the discussion we'll be able to, to try to make some of those connections. Um, and if I, can do, if I can be a tenth as convincing as Cornell West, I'll be pleased. Um, so we'll go from there. Uh, I, uh, I guess just, well, to bring you the latest the latest news, I guess, Gail had some news from the, the New York Times, but, from the internet today. But mm -hmm. but I also got an email that um, the latest act of drone resistance was yesterday, and um, Kathy Kelly and uh, Georgia Walker got arrested um, out at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri protesting the drones. Uh, so, 
I don't know too much more about what what happened out there, except except I got the word. Okay. Um, I, I think all of you know that I come from the Catholic worker perspective, just to say, and and um, and that that's one of nonviolence. Um, and the thing. The thing about approaching drones from nonviolence is it, it's sort of a no-brainer. Um, drones, uh, weaponized drones, kill people. Killing people is bad. Um, so I, I'm not going to approach it here. I'll, I'll try to use somewhat more the framework of just war theory and international law, or at least address that. But if that gets too boring, we we can uh, we can skip some of that. Um, what I want to argue is that drones present a profound challenge to just war thinking and to international law, um, a challenge that's as great in its way as was the challenge of nuclear weapons. Okay? Um, in, in the wake of the atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, many just war theories um, became what were known as nuclear pacifists. Uh, people who believed that there were such, was such a thing as just war, but that given the tremendous destructive power of nuclear weapons, um, the possibility for a just war simply no longer existed. Um, drones, which are touted as precision weapons, um, I think raise fundamentally different problems for people who would think about just war or international law approaches. Um, and I, I think it's maybe useful to, to just for a moment try to contrast drones with the nuclear bomb. Um, the nuclear bomb is, is the ultimate modern weapon. Devastatingly powerful, mass destruction for a mass society, um, it stretched the limits of our concept of war, um, creating a new boundary for the destructive power of war um, with the whole of humanity, indeed the whole planet, with the exception of cockroaches apparently, um, mm -hmm. being at, at risk. Um, it led military analysts to develop the notion of the nuclear firebreak, that you had to make a distinction between nuclear weapons and every other type of weapon. Uh, um, and a concept that kind of ruled until in, in preparation for attacking Iraq, um, the notion of weapons of mass destruction, which blurs the nuclear fire break, um, became, uh, became more popular. Um, total war with nuclear weapons became so horrible that almost everyone, except for Herman Kahn, realized that the only thing to do was to prevent it. Um, so. The bomb's destructive power simply meant that no benefits could outweigh the costs of a nuclear war, and nuclear war became, in postmodernist language, the ultimate grand narrative. The drone, in contrast, I would say is the ultimate postmodern weapon, okay? obliterating space and time um, to the point where a human sitting in DeWitt, New York, can kill a human across the planet in Afghanistan. As one uh, drone pilot put it, the war is 7,500 miles away, the distance from Creech Air Force Base to Afghanistan. It is also 15 inches away, um, the distance from my face to the screen. Mm -hmm. So time and space gets obliterated. Um, the drone stretches the limits of war in the opposite direction from the bomb, uh, making war not unthinkable, but far too thinkable far too easy, um, nearly indistinguishable from just normal, quote unquote, murders. Um, so war becomes no longer a grand narrative, but a loosely connected network of mini narratives. Drones then raise questions which just war thinking has never previously had to consider. Um, so what are drones? Drones are pilotless aircraft. Um, also known as RPAs, um, re which stands for Remotely Piloted Aircraft, or UAVs, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles. At, at the latest trial that I was at at Hancock, um, one of the officers from the base carefully explained that 
we were totally misguided because they didn't have any drones at Hancock. They only had RPAs. And he, he defined drones as totally autonomous as opposed to remotely piloted, um, which of course by his definition means that there are no drones anywhere because they haven't developed any truly <laughs> autonomous drones yet. Um, but uh, uh, an example of the military use of language. Okay, the entire system needed to fly drones, including the ground-based control system, on-site launching, and the drone itself is known as a UAS, or Unmanned Aerial System. Okay? Um, the primary use of drones so far has been for surveillance, um, and that raises many questions, but ones that I, I'm not planning on dealing with in any depth today. What I want to talk about tonight, and what I hope you do, is weaponized drones, uh, RPAs, which are designed to carry and fire weapons. Um, the primary weaponized drones used by the United States thus far are the MQ-1 Predator and the more powerful MQ-9 Reaper, uh, which is what's flown out of Hancock. The Reaper can carry four Hellfire missiles as well as several um, laser-guided 500-pound bombs. Okay, Who uses weaponized drones? Well, um, much of their information, of course, is classified, and um, exactly how it works, I, I don't know it firsthand because every effort of mine to approach a drone control center has resulted in me being led away in handcuffs, um, so I have to rely on <clears throat> secondary resources for that. Um, basically, one of these days, maybe I'll come again. Um, basically, weaponized drones are flown by two organizations in the U.S. First, the U.S. military or Department of Defense, um, primarily the Air Force and the Air National Guard, but also, um, for those who have seen the Dirty Wars from JSOC, uh, Special Operations, I guess, has their own drone operation. Um, they're used, we're told that, they're, that the military drones are used in war zones, um, particularly Afghanistan and previously in Iraq, and they're piloted out of bases like Creech in Nevada, Hancock in Syracuse. And then the second organization is the CIA, um, which flies predators and reapers in non-war zones, such as Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Um, and CIA drones are controlled from centers such, uh, such as Langley, Virginia. Okay. Now, I had prepared a. Uh, pass these around. I, I had prepared a PowerPoint, but I uh, also came prepared with the more basic handouts. So uh, I'll refer to this in a couple places. On the on the second page, just to give you an idea of where things are being flown out of. Um, the Air Force in 2011 published, um, Sorry. published two maps of where drone-related activities were occurring in the United States. Um, okay, the first, the top one on the second page is just Air Force drone activities, and it's if you look at it carefully, you can see, again, how truthful our uh, military is. Um, Hancock in Syracuse is located in, in the middle of Massachusetts, <laughs> you might note. Um, oh, my God. It, um, although they did get it right on the next map, for, for, so... What their deception was about, I don't know. Um, it, it's also this is also not up to date. For instance, the uh, the Air Force base in Niagara Falls has been slated to become uh, a a drone control center, and it's wasn't on the map even as proposed in in 2011. I'm not sure. I don't think the drones have actually the drone control center has actually been established there, but but they are gearing up for that. And then it, um, if you look at all of the D Department of Defense um, activities, you can see that it's, drones are pretty extensive. They're, the military is wrapped 
ramping up to do drones. I haven't been able to get a, find a map anywhere of where the CIA drone control centers are, although we do know that they operate one in Langley. I, I've got to assume that they have more, given the number of missions that they that they have carried out in Afghan, in Pakistan, and Yemen. But uh, I don't don't know that for sure. Okay, so there's so many. Harry. They are now. I'm not sure that they are all. I, I don't think that they are all drone control centers. They they list them as drone related activities. So there, you know, there can be training centers and testing centers and, mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that. Um, and, and also when, when a drone flies, it, um, there are usually multiple people at different locations involved in <coughs> decisions about where to go and particularly who to strike. Okay. Harry, you said the, the first map was 2011? Yes. And what was the second map, what year? They're both 2011. 2011. The, the only difference is one is just Air Force drone centers, and the second one is all the Department of Defense drone yeah. centers. Okay. And uh, yeah, th those that's pretty extensive. Okay. Could I just add to certainly the, the hundreds of drones on the, on the in the south looks like there could be a lot of border control stuff. Do you think? Um, There's so many down. I think yeah. I th the south. That's a good point. I think it could be, it's, but it, it's also probably a, a factor is that there's generally more military bases in the South okay. um, than, than yeah. here, but, but I'm sure that some of them, especially for, at least for surveillance, are being used, um, used along the border. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, how are... How are weaponized drones actually used? It's kind of a simplification, but I think you can say that we've been using weaponized drones in for three purposes. Um, first, in support of U.S. troops in in battle, um, directing troops to opposing forces, and sometimes sending in drones to uh, to kill the forces directly, enemies directly, if if they're in places that U.S. troops can't get to. Um, one account of this use of drones is, is a book that came out a couple years ago called Predator by drone pilot Matt Martin, which is kind of a, an interesting book because he tries to portray himself as as much of a hero sitting there and piloting the drone as, um, you know, as Air Force pilots or more traditional military heroes. And, and he does actually end up going to... Iraq and Afghanistan um, to be on, to help to launch the drones so that he can say that he was in the actually in the war zone. It's it's an inter, um, kind of an interesting book to read. The second purpose is targeted killing um, as an assassination tool, and, and I think we've heard a lot about that. This um, targeting specific individuals, essentially anywhere on the planet. Um, Outside of Afghanistan, this mission is primarily conducted by the CIA, and um, as Jeremy Scahill documented in, in both the film and the book Dirty Wars, uh, it's with targeted killings that um, the drone operation is in competition with JSOC, with special forces, which um, usually uh, takes a more personal touch to targeted killing, um, you know, send, sending in special operations forces and and the CIA and JSOC have sort of had a an institutional rivalry for who who should be given control of our targeted killing. Okay. And the third use of drones is signature strikes, uh, which is killing people uh, who have not been individually identified as targets based on their having the visual, quote, signature of insurgents or terrorists. Um, this, um, and, and that signature has, has been as broad as being a male between the ages of 15 and 65 qualifies you as being a militant if you're in the tribal areas of Pakistan, for instance. 
Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's really a, a form of ethnic uh, profiling um, and has reportedly been scaled back by the Obama, Obama administration, but the truth of what's going on, I think, remains to be seen. Okay. Now, there are... So, are, are you with me on that? Some, I hope this isn't too simple. Okay, there are two narratives about drones. There's the official narrative of the U.S. government um, broadcast um, rather uncritically by what uh, what we might call the, the corporate media or what I like to call the cheerleader media. Um, and then there's the narrative of drone victims, which can be found occasionally, usually in places like indie media or alternative media. Okay. Um, the U.S. government gives us a narrative of drones as the wave of the future. Drones are the latest science fiction weaponry, something out of Star Wars or Terminator. They save American lives, not only because they can kill without risking American pilots, but because they can be and have been used as, quote, force protectors in Afghanistan and Iraq, killing the bad guys who threaten U.S. troops in the midst of battle. Um, because they are precision weapons, according to this narrative, they also save civilian lives compared to older styles of warfare. We're going to look at that claim in, in some detail. Drone operators have talked about having the feeling of godlike power, smiting from afar, as well as having a god's eye view of the situation. Um, they sometimes refer to their victims as bug splat because that's what they look like from that aerial vantage point. Um, drones are revolutionizing the US military, and this revolution will continue into the foreseeable future as drones become more ubiquitous and also more autonomous. Um, they are the wave of the future. The Air Force is now training more drone pilots and for the last few years has been training more drone pilots than conventional pilots. And of course, they possess the ultimate American virtue. They're cheap uh, relative to manned aircraft, so they're, quote, cost effective. And of course, if you have that virtue, nothing else matters. But there's another narrative to be heard, one not so well funded. Uh, the story of the drone victims. I haven't traveled to Afghanistan or Pakistan to hear the voices of the victims, but friends of mine have. Um, Judy Bellows, a friend of all of ours, um, Kathy Kelly from Chicago, James Ricks of Ithaca. Um, they've talked to survivors of drone at attacks and relatives of victims of drone strikes. They have told of people living under the constant buzz of drones, never, never knowing when or where or why hellfire will strike. They have told horrifying stories of people mourning for their loved ones, taken away in a manner reminiscent of Jesus' description of the final days. Uh, two men will be out in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. A, grandfather, a grandmother was working in her garden. Dozens were celebrating a wedding. A young boy was at a barbecue. They didn't know the day or hour, but it wasn't God who took them. It was human beings to whom technology had given godlike, or I would say satanic, powers to strike from nowhere, to end lives in a heartbeat, and to transform lives forever. Um, I've been convinced that these drone victims were not terrorists. Many, many of them were ordinary people whose lives were simply end ended. And I'll, I'll share a couple of stories. Uh, Judy could share do a much better job since she's talked to people who've experienced this. But on November 3rd, 2002, in the first drone strike on record, the CIA, with Department of Defense approval, launched a Hellfire missile from a Predator drone flying out of Djibouti into Yemen. It killed Abu Ali al-Harithi and five companions, including an American citizen, Ahmed Hijazi, also known as Kamal Dervish, of Buffalo, New York. Um, at first, it was announced that this was a Yemeni air operation, but eventually Paul Wolfowitz confirmed that it was a US drone strike. Thus, the very first CIA-launched 
drone strike killed an American citizen. No charges, no trial, no due process. There have been at least four more American citizens killed by drone strikes since then, um, including Al-Qaeda propagandist Anwar Awalaki, um, and a month later, his 16-year-old son, Abdul, Abdul Rahman Awalaki, um, who was killed in a separate drone strike, although they like, like to say that that was an accident, and they like to pretend. Uh, uh, one of our prosecutors tried to pretend that they were killed in the same drone strike um, to make it sound more legitimate, I guess. Um, the killing of American citizens by drones with no due process raises questions of violation not only of international law, but of the basic principles of US law. I hate it when I have to go back to defending US law. Um, I especially remember the story of Karik, Tariq Aziz, um, a 16-year-old from Waziristan in Pakistan, who was killed by a drone strike in October 2011, the day before we started the Hancock 38 trial for nonviolently attempting to bring a war crimes indictment to the commander of Hancock Air National Guard Base. Um, Tariq had just attended a, a jirga, or tribal assembly, in Islamabad, where villagers from tribal areas met with other Pakistanis and a few Westerners to talk about drone strikes. He spoke movingly of his cousin, who had been killed by a drone strike a year previously. Tariq returned home, um, encouraged to start to document the effects of drone strikes in the area, um, kind of his own indie media. And a few days later, he himself, along with a cousin, uh, was killed by a drone while driving near his home. Um, those, those who met him were convinced that he was neither Taliban nor Al-Qaeda, just a teenage boy concerned about his people. Um, we kept his photograph on display um, throughout most of our trial. A few months earlier, on March 17, 2011, a U.S. drone fired two missiles into a, a jirga at the bus depot in Data Kel in North Waziristan, uh, killing at least 42 people. Um, the U.S. government insisted that all the dead were militants. However, workers from Stanford Law School and NYU School of Law clinics interviewed survivors and found that the jirga was not a gathering of terrorists, but a gathering of tribal elders who were meeting to settle a, dis a dispute over a nearby chromite mine. Okay. And final story, on November 1st, 2013, Taliban leader Hakimullah Massoud was killed by a drone strike in Pakistan. Although Massoud was apparently responsible for US attacks on US supply lines, through the Khyber Pass. His killing was rather suspicious. It came at a time when Massoud was about to begin peace negotiations with the government of Pakistan, um, and his death derailed the peace talks. Again, merely a coincidence, I'm sure. Um, there's an, so those are the two major narratives. One of them gets a lot of press. The other gets relatively little. Um, I hope you don't mind if I, uh, I inject here three another type of narrative, which would be uh, biblical stories. Um, I, I use this at Fisher, and I kind of like it, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, three, three images that I think are powerful. The first is from the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 17. Moses therefore said to Joshua, pick out certain men, and tomorrow go out and engage Amalek in battle. I will be standing on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him. He engaged Amalek in battle after Moses had climbed to the top of the hill with Aaron and Hur. As long as Moses kept his hands raised up, Israel had the better of the fight. But when he let his hands rest, Amalek had the better of the fight. Moses' hands, however, grew tired, so they put a rock in place for him to sit on. Meanwhile, Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset, and Joshua mowed down Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Moses, perhaps, could be viewed as the patron saint of drone mm -hmm. pilots, controlling the battle from afar, uh, using seated, using only the position of his hands. The second is the story of the Holy Innocents from the Gospel of Matthew, where King Herod, in an attempt to kill the infant Jesus, quote, ordered the massacre of all the boys two years old and under in Bethlehem and its environs, 
making his calculations on the basis of the date he had learned from the astrologers. Herod could be considered the patron saint of collateral damage, those who accept civilian losses in an attempt to eliminate their target. And the final story is from Luke, where after being rejected by a village of Samaritans, two of the disciples, James and John, turned to Jesus and said, Lord, will you not have us call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And he turned to them only to reprimand them. So although hellfire missiles raining, raining down from heaven may have appealed to James and John, um, Jesus, I think, would be the patron saint of drone resistors. So, and for Christians, I think the question is, which of these biblical models do we want to uh, follow? Okay. Now, to turn to just war theory, okay, um, the just war theory asserts that a war can be just only if it meets certain requirements, um, and this theory forms the basis for the international law of war, um, which was begun by uh, Hugo Grotius around 16... 25 during the time of the Thirty Years' War. It's been the standard approach of the Catholic Church since it was imported into Christian theology by Ambrose and Augustine roughly 400 years after the birth of Jesus. Um, it's also been the standard for most Protestant churches with the notable exceptions of the Anabaptists and the Quakers mm. who um, kind of returned to biblical nonviolence. Um, I should note the just war theory has no biblical roots. It's never mentioned in the Bible. Um, in fact, the only theory of war contained in the entire New Testament comes from the letter of James, where James says, where do the wars and where do the conflicts among you come from? Is it not from your passions that make war within your members? You covet but do not possess. You kill and envy but you cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. So the, the, that, what chapter is that? I, I got it. That, that is James okay. chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Um, yeah, I, that, I think, is the biblical powerful. theory of war. It's yeah. greed and yep. possessions. Okay, So just war was actually an import from the theology of the Roman Empire. Mm. Ambrose and Augustine adopted it from Cicero, who got it from the Fitzialis priests, who were the priests who were charged with appealing to Jupiter to endorse the justice of a war. So from the very beginning, the idea of just war um, was, was the product of an empire and the tool of an empire. Um, the just war theory has two main sets of criteria, um, what are known as jus ad bellum. I guess I could write that down. And jus in bello. Mm. Okay. Where jus ad bellum basically refers to the justice of declaring a war, whether a war itself is just. Jus in bello are just criteria for waging a war. Okay. And just real briefly, there are seven in jus ad bellum criteria that usually be are referred to. The first is just cause, that the war has to be waged for a just cause, and in modern times that has come down to self-defense. At least that's the way the United Nations basically defines it. Um, the second is right intention, which means that you really have to be wa waging the war for that just cause that you claim that you're waging the war for. Um, the third is competent, author competent authority. War must be declared by a legitimate authority. The fourth is last resort. War can only be waged when all other options have been ex exhausted. The fifth is comparative justice. A warring nation must always acknowledge that no side has exclusive claim to right and justice. The sixth is probability of success, that war should not be waged in a lost cause. And the seventh is proportionality, that the benefits of going to war must outweigh the costs. There are only two jus in bello criteria. Okay, and, and those are discrimination, 
which means that acts of war have to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, and you may not target non-combatants. Um, that gets that, that targeting becomes a crucial issue um, to the extent that when um, when the U.S. Bishop's Peace Pastoral was being debated in the 1980s, the Reagan administration made made the case that they were targeting using nuclear weapons that were targeted at military targets, um, and and the reasoning basically went that if you if you targeted the center of a city and nuked it, that was unjust because you were targeting civilians. But if there was a military target within the city and you targeted that, you'd kill the same civilians, but that was okay because you hadn't targeted them. Okay, just, just to give you a, a flair for how much I love just war theory. Okay, and the second criterion is proportionality, that each act of war and each weapon must be judge, judged in terms of whether the benefits of its use outweigh the costs. Okay, and these are still the same criteria if you, that lawyers are using if you if you see discussions of international law. Um, I, I want to first look at drones in light of these criteria, and and we'll start with just means of going to war. Since drones are just a weapon, you might think that those are totally irrelevant, only, and only just means of waging war should be considered. But one of my major points is that drones blur the line between war and peace. Um, drones make the decision to kill in a different country uh, relatively cheap and easy. Um, much easier than if, you, if, if for a president than if a president had to send troops in to accomplish a mission, because uh, number one, drones are, as I said, are relatively cheap economically, but they're also cheap politically. If you're sending in U.S. troops, you run the risk of them being killed, and then it becomes a bad thing. If if a drone mission goes wrong, and you lose the drone, if you're lucky. Nobody will ever know. You know, you don't have any people to account for. You may lose a million dollars because you lost the drone. But well, you know, I mean, you can sneeze and spend a million dollars. What's that? Um, Except when it lands in Iran. And, and so, the very existence of drones makes it that much more likely that you'll, you know, that we will undertake missions that we wouldn't have undertaken if there hadn't been drones which raises the likelihood that you know we'll get we'll get provoke um, some real wars by doing this okay so use odd bellum criteria first the CIA's use of drones raises that question of competent authority um, Pakistan Yemen and Somalia are not countries in which the US is at war therefore there's no legitimate authority to order killings in those countries. Uh, in US law, only military personnel are allowed to kill in a war, presumably including the war on terror, and so CIA drone killings, at least in my, in, in my view, violate this principle um, because CIA agents are not authorized to kill people. Um, and, and of course, it goes against the the prohibition on assassinations that started back with President Ford. Okay. Secondly, as I said, drones make killing relatively easy and risk-free, greatly attempting presidents to use them long before a situation reaches the point where they're a last resort. So they almost eliminate that idea that you don't go to war except as a last resort. And Similarly, they raise the issue of proportionality because they may lead to more war. Perhaps the most controversial issue is the Yusin Bello issue of discrimination, whether drones increase or decrease <coughs> the risk of killing civilians. The Obama administration claims that few civilians have been killed by drones. In June 2011, John Brennan 
now CIA director, said that, quote, nearly for the past year there hasn't been a single collateral death because of the exceptional proficiency, precision of the capabilities that we've been able to develop, unquote. Um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is a good source for data about drones, um, rather rapidly disproved that false claim. And yet, um, at the Nazareth graduation uh, last year, in 2013, uh, Senator Charles Schumer um, personally informed me that drones had never c killed any civilians. Oh, um, so you shouldn't even be here listening to me, because Chuck, Chuck, Chuck has... Hmm? Well, it, they made the mistake... Twice in the last four years, they've made the mistake of bringing Chuck Schumer in. He always appears by surprise um, to give a talk at the graduation. And twice in the last four years, they've made the mistake of bringing him in past where the faculty are lined up to go in. And so I've uh, <clears throat> engaged him in a, an interesting discussion about drones uh, both times. This time, I guess, his security guards got smarter and brought him in a different way. Um, but anyway. So, Harry, excuse me, what did you say the Journal of Investigative Journalism came out with? What did they say? Well, they came out with data, which, which I'm going to be sharing with you in a few minutes, ah, okay. um, that they have killed, that drones have killed civilians. Okay. Uh, President Obama, in his May 23rd, uh, 2013 speech on drone policy, that, the one that um, Medea Benjamin so wonderfully interrupted, and, and where he said that you should, where Obama said you should listen to this woman, which is maybe the first statement that he said that I've agreed with wholeheartedly in a long, long time. Um, Obama admitted that it is a hard fact that U.S. strikes have resulted in civilian casualties, a risk that exists in every war, and for the families of those civilians, no words or legal construct can justify their loss. He continued, Quote, to do nothing in the face of terrorist networks would invite far more civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. The death toll from their acts of terrorism against Muslims dwarfs any estimate of civilian casualties from drone strikes, so doing nothing is not an option. Well, as a follower of Dorothy Day and Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King, I find it intriguing that President Obama should assume that refraining from killing means that you're doing nothing, that the only options are kill or mm -hmm. do nothing. Um, <laughs> He continues a bit later, but the high threshold that we've set for taking lethal actions applies to all potential terrorist targets, regardless of whether or not they are American civilians. This threshold respects the inherent dignity of every human life. I'm not sure I agree these, with that. These, anyway. these people have noses that are about two feet long. <laughs> oh, yeah. there's a, a lot of lying going on. Well, anyway, what? and here I've got to apologize, but as a sociologist... I always got to bring in some statistics, and the question of numbers of drone strikes is, uh, is I think, worth looking at. And, and I've, so I do have some, some data on this. First, you know, caveat emptor, you know, statistics lie. All, and if, if you use, if you just use your common sense thinking about statistics, um, it's pretty obvious that nobody knows exactly how many people have been killed by drones and certainly uh, don't know how many of them have been, quote, real militants, how many have been civilians. Um, we know that there's probably, that there's probably less than 10% have been confirmed militants, maybe only 5%, um, probably at least you know 10% have been confirmed civilians and probably 80% Nobody knows. Um, if you, and, and it, it, it all depends on how you define and, and a civilian versus a militant. If you define them the way the Obama administration has, that a, a militant is any male between the ages of 15 and, and 65, then yeah, most of the people we've killed have been militants. Um, if, you, if you demand an ID that this person was a known militant, then we've killed very few militants. Well, Harry, can I just can I just ask or, or say what what I read about that was that um, they define those that that age group as militants when they're hanging around when they're when they're in some proximity to what are the combatants or the terrorists or whatever isn't that right I mean it's well not just, 
He sounds like young black people in the neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or guilt by association. Well, well, it is, it is guilt by association, for sure. Yeah. Well, but also, I, I mean, that's what they say, but what, what, what information we have is, uh, you know, certainly it depends on whether their activities look, quote, suspicious from the air, um, and sometimes just gathering together can be suspicious. There was one one case a few years ago where um, there were members of a couple of families were traveling together on a trip, and in, in the morning they, they were traveling in, I think, three SUVs, and in the morning they got out of the SUVs to do their morning prayer. That looked suspicious, and so... That's right. You know, and so the the drones hit them. Um, Actually, I think in that case, the drones called in helicopters, which hit them and uh, you know killed killed a bunch of children. Also, in in that instance too, um, what became clear, I I think that was the case where the L.A. Times um, got the transcript of the discussions that went on about this killing, and. The drone operators and the sensor operators would negotiate the the age of the people. You know, someone would say, "Well, that that looks like a pretty young kid." No, nah, anything has got you know, got to be at least thirteen or fourteen. That's old enough to be a militant. Um, you know, the, 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 these things get negotiated based on these images from from way up above, and and they, you know. And so there's a lot, a lot of wiggle room yeah. in the negotiations, and that can often end up um, resulting in deaths. Okay, so if, if we go to the charts here, for, if, if I've given enough caveats, um, this is the best I've been able to put together from a variety of sources. Um, for the the most detail that we have for the most part are for Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Those uh, there's two fairly reputable sources: uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, and the New America Foundation. The New American Foundation tends to be a bit more conservative in their es- estimates, and both of the both of these groups put their estimates together. Um, primarily from news reports and have different criteria for how many news reports they um, require. The Bureau for Investigative Journalism publishes minimum and maximum estimates. They, they publish a range rather than a single number. Mm-hmm. And okay, um, So this first chart kind of gives a, a cumulative breakdown of first of drone strikes Um, up through March of 2014, um, except that the Afghanistan figures, the U.S. Air Force stopped reporting the number of drone strikes in Afghanistan, um, I think in 2012, and and so we don't, so it's a mystery at how many drone strikes are there, but as you can see, almost three-quarters of the drone strikes, over two-thirds, um, have been in Afghanistan, and since that's a war zone, that the information there is only now kind of starting to leak out. I've been looking for it for years, and just just starting to find it. About a quarter of the strikes have been in Pakistan, and then only about five percent um, in Yemen, and, and there've only been five recorded drone strikes in Somalia. In Somalia, we tend to use. Uh, JSOC, more for the targeted killings. Okay. The, the next graph that I put together is a line graph which gives, again, a number of estimates for drone strikes in the four countries, just to give you an idea of how that has changed over the years. Um, several points, I think, are important. First, the largest number of drone strikes has been in Afghanistan. Um, and unfortunately, they've stopped report, the U.S. Air Force has stopped reporting that. Um, 
there can be a source of confusion can be the difference between drone strikes and weapons launched from drones. And if you look at the two, the, the two blue lines, um, the one with the orange dots is weapons launched from drones in Afghanistan. Harry? Yeah. I want to see gray and... Oh, you, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll have to show... Um, okay, the top, the top line yeah. is weapons launched from drones in Afghanistan. The second line is drone strikes. Okay? And the reason that there's a difference is that many times in when a drone strikes, they, they do what Medea Benjamin calls a double tap, uh, which is that they launch two Hellfire missiles a few minutes apart at the same target. So that in many strikes, there's two missiles launched. Now, the official version of why they do that is, is that that will confirm the kill in case the first one misses. Um, Afghans and Pakistanis on the ground uh, tend to think that it's a deliberate targeting of first responders. That any, oh. anybody who's trying to come to the aid of someone who's just been hurt by a drone strike risks death themselves, um, which mm -hmm. given the way that the United States worships first responders in the wake of 9-11, it's yeah. very ironic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you note the, and, and again, I'm sorry that I did this, this is in gray, but the second line, the next line here is strikes in Pakistan, which, um, and they peaked in 2010 at, at about between 120 and 130 strikes. Um, the numbers started to decrease in Pakistan, um, I think largely in response to public pressure and pressure from the Pakistani government. Um, at this point, in all of 2014, there have been no recorded drone strikes in Pakistan. Um, I, I think, again, largely as a result of, of the pressure. Of course, it does, as a sociologist, raise the question of, well, what's the CIA doing with their drones mm -hmm. if they're not killing people in Pakistan? And, and as, as a sociologist, I know that once you have a, you know, once once you have technology in place, you're going to find a use for it. So if they can't use it in Pakistan, what are they doing? Well, one thing is that they've stepped up their use of drones in Yemen, which if if if, if you can see, that's th this next line where the number of drone strikes in Yemen had been almost none. And now, in the last few years, they have picked up to the point where there are as many, or more, at, at, as of 2014, more drone strikes in mm -hmm. Yemen than in Pakistan. So the, the drone war for the CIA has shifted from Yemen to Pakistan. Um, only been a few strikes in Somalia. Um, and I should note here that I don't have any data on the drone strikes in Iraq or Libya. We've no, known they've been some, but I haven't gotten that together to try to put into that graph. Okay. Um, now to move to casualties, that's where there's real differences in the different sources that you use. Generally, the Bureau for Investigative Journalism will come out with higher figures um, than the New American Foundation. Neither of them report um, casualties for Afghanistan. However, the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan, UNAMA, um, their annual report for 2013 confirmed um, 14 civilian injuries and 45 civilian deaths from drones. Um, and I think, okay. And that's on the, the graph on the top of page five. Um, in 2012, they said there were 16 deaths from drones, civilian deaths from drones. We don't have, and I haven't been able to find any estimates of how many total casualties from drones there are in Afghanistan. But one of the things that UNAMA did was to look at the percentage of aerial strike civilian deaths or, 
or they gave me the numbers where I could calculate this, where the weapon is known for 2013. Um, and if you go back, I'm sorry, to the, to the bottom of page four, you can see that 49% of civilian casualties were caused by drones, 32% um, by fixed wing aircraft, 20% by helicopter. Okay. Um, if you move to the bottom of page five, and I, I'm sorry, I know these, these statistics get very boring, but, but this I think is important. If you compare that 49% of known civilians in 2013 killed by, by drones, um, the data that the Air Force gave for 2012 was that of the weapons released from aircraft, uh, under 10% were released from drones, which seems to indicate that if drone, drones are launching only 10% of the weapons but killing half the, pe half the civilians, okay, that drones <clears throat> are actually more likely to kill civilians perhaps counterintuitively, than attacks from manned aircraft. Okay? And this was confirmed in 2013. Uh, Dr. Larry Lewis reported in PRISM, uh, which is an online DOD publication you can reach, that he had conducted a top secret study of the Afghan war um, for the military and concluded that drones were significantly more likely to kill civilians than were manned aircraft. And I, I, now he did, since his study was secret, I can't get his figures. This was as close as I could come to putting them together. He told the Guardian newspaper um, that drones were an order of magnitude more likely to kill civilians than manned aircraft. Um, and an order of magnitude in scientific terms means 10 times yeah. as much. I didn't come up with quite that big a difference, but. But clearly, this is the first evidence, hard evidence that I've seen that drones are actually more likely to kill civilians, more likely to violate that rule of discriminating between civil combatants and non-combatants than, um, than manned aircraft. Okay, I've got some other data that um, breaks it down by country. I, I think I won't bore you with, with that, but you can look at it. Um, can you tell by which agencies of the U.S. government are involved in certain ones whether they're more likely to skip the rules or more likely to follow the rules? For instance, if uh, the domestic, some of our domestic agencies, uh, met CIA, FBI, I don't know, police, whether they're, they're a little more careful or whether the military is more careful? I don't have... I don't have any real information about that. Um, you know, we're told that they're, you know, that they're not flying armed, armed drones, that the drones domestically are being used for surveillance, um, and hopefully that Reaper drone that crashed out of Hancock up in, in, uh, in Lake Ontario, um, not too many miles from the nuclear plant there, if, if I followed the map, uh, wasn't wasn't armed, although if it, had, if it had crashed 10 miles away into the nuclear plant, it might not have mattered whether it was armed or not, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, again, exactly, you know, we're getting a little bit more information out about how decisions are made, but very, it's, it's funny, I think at this point we probably have more information about the process that goes on within the military because there have, there has been at least one drone pilot who um, has renounced his ways. Who's uh, there's a, a really good if, if you're doing the if you're doing the films, uh, there's a, a good documentary about an hour long called Unmanned, which um, has an interview with a drone pilot. So he talks about that. Um, so we know more about the effects of the CIA, but less about the internal process of 
the CIA's decisions about launching drones. All right. Could, could you just, you said Dr. Larry Lewis, I think you said. Yes. A secret study, but then it was, it was in a magazine or something? Well, the study wasn't, but he co-authored an article in, in this magazine where he talk, had a couple of sentences. In what um, it, it was, um, excuse me, like I'm just blanking on it. Um, you said the Guardian? Prism. 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 Prism is the name. And, which you can find online, or if you can't find it, I can, the, I've saved a copy of the article, okay. so I, I can send that Thank to you. you. I think that, that's well worth uh, taking a look at. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let me, yes. Hmm? Okay. Um, Another kind of pressing issue, not really covered by Yusin Bello principles, um, but which has been raised actually by, by Air Force officers, is whether striking from afar, from a position of complete safety, is, is itself immoral. I mean, it's, you know, it's a turkey shoot rather than, than a war. And, and, and this is sort of a critique that's beginning to develop of drones from the warrior ethos, you know, um, that um, especially there's an Air Force pilot named M. Shane Rizza who published a book last year called Killing Without Heart, Limits on Robotic Warfare in an Age of Persistent Conflict, um, where, where he basically argued that turning things over to drones is simply you know, is destroying the warrior ethos and the kill. Now, I'm not sure what killing with heart, with heart <laughs> means. Um, <laughs> what were you going to read? I have a somewhat related question that I, okay. uh, earlier. Uh, there's talk about you know, the reaction of people that um, are, you know, are not militants, um, making it easier for them to be recruited by people that are because of everything that's going on, it occurred to me that um, while, um, you know, if I'm one of the non-militants and say my fiance is killed as a civilian on the way up with the bridal, you know, whatever, any, in any event I would be upset, but it, it's, it seems that uh, if I were aware that it was a drone rather than a military uh, uh, air vehicle or ground vehicle, or whatever, um, that somebody in the complete safety, um, you know, of a military base back in their country, you know, experiencing, well, i just say experiencing, I already said that. But the, 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 um, it seemed like that might add a whole new dimension to the outrage. And while we're talking about white hot outrage in any event, it might, it might be just enough more to convince somebody to join the militants. Very, very much so, and especially in the tribal areas of Pakistan, which where the Pashtun have a warrior culture, that this is, you know, attacking like this is seen as so disgusting and cowardly mm -hmm. that that it just enrages people. Also, as as Chalmers Johnson, you know, pointed out, you know, not with respect to drones, but um, one of the main reasons for terrorism, for striking civilian populations, is that the U.S. military is often such an impenetrable target that if you want to strike at something, you know that you have no choice but to strike at something that's not so in, not so impenetrable. And drones just make that situation, you know, so much so much worse. Um, you know, are you? really going to be able to strike at the people who are actually killing your family? Probably not. So you strike at somebody. Mm. Okay. So it, it's, uh, you know, it's a terrible <coughs> thing. I, I, you know, we've been pointing out in Syracuse that, that really uh, Hancock Air National Guard Base has turned Syracuse into a war zone. Because according to the According to the laws of war, those armed 
officers who are pushing the button that's killing people in Afghanistan, they're armed combatants. And therefore, if a suicide bomber comes over to take one of them out, they're, that's not a terrorist. They're killing an armed combatant. That's, you know, there's many interpretations of that, but some scholars would say, you know, that's legal in war. So if, 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 if that pilot goes to watch their kid's soccer game in uniform and a suicide bomber takes out the whole soccer game, that's not an act of terrorism, right? Because, so it, it puts... Well, that whole use of the word terror and terrorism and the concept of terror, terrorism is, uh, is very open to discussion. I mean, uh, many people just feel war in itself is, is uh, terrorism or terror. So. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I've, I fail to see the difference between war and terrorism uh, myself. Mm -hmm. but. Okay, a couple other aspects of international law, and then I, I'll talk about talk a little bit about kind of the resistance that's going on at Hancock, if that's okay, if that's okay just to, to update you. Um, some of the things that we've been appealing to is the UN Charter, Chapter 1, Article 2, Section 6 states, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Um, basically under the UN Charter, use of force against another state except in self-defense um, is only justified if it's been sanctioned by the UN Security Council. Okay? Um, clearly CIA drone attra attacks in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia and other countries violate from my perspective the UN ch Charter. Um, it's also an important issue because international law makes this distinction between war zones and non-war zones and different laws apply. Um, basically, if it's not a war zone, then international human rights law applies, which means you can't kill people. Um, you know, only the police are authorized of, of a country are authorized to kill people if there's not a war zone declared. Um, this whole idea of the war on terror makes the whole planet a war zone, as the Bush administration interpreted it, and the Obama administration has done a little bit different rhetoric, but in practice has, has maintained the same thing. Um, we also need to think about the Nuremberg principles, um, particularly crimes against peace, and in Afghanistan perhaps war crimes, and, and the fact that under the Nuremberg principles, um, number one, um, being under orders is not an excuse, and, and number two, uh, complicity, uh, you know, we are all complicit in the war crimes of our government. It's one of the, one of the reasons, justifications that we give for doing civil resistance, okay? Um, just two things about the future. And when, when I think about the future with drones, all I can think about is, is that great song from Leonard Cohen, I, I have seen the future, baby. It is murder. Because um, that's what the future with drones is. Uh, Americans have been pretty supportive of drones in large part because we haven't yet had to fight an enemy which possesses weaponized drones. They're great for saving American lives as long as we have the monopoly. However, what happens when other nations acquire them? Um, I'm reminded of the history of the machine gun. When it was first invented, the machine gun was a wonderful weapon, wonderful for the US Army to use to mow down Native Americans, wonderful for European powers to use to, to mow down um, colonial revolts. Um, but when World War I came up around, around when both, quote, civilized sides had machine guns and that other uh, fairly simple invention of barbed wire, um, all of a sudden this wonderful weapon became a disaster to which you know, tens of thousands of people lost their lives and this time it was white males mowing down white males which made it much more horrible. Um, 
you know, a weapon can seem really good if we've got the monopoly and we're killing the other. But what happens when both sides have it? And it doesn't take the resources of a nation state to create a weaponized drone. Um, you know, almost, you know, the technology, it's not like creating a nuclear bomb. The technology is pretty simple and uh, lots, of group, lots of groups are capable of doing it. So, you know, what happens when oppositional gr groups acquire their own and start deciding that there are some Americans that they'd like to target, perhaps with good reason? Um, skies filled with killer drones. Is this the kind of world we want to give our children? Um, perhaps an even more frightening future, future prospect is that of autonomous killer drones. Um, a current line of research which the government is funding is the effort to allow drones and other robots to become autonomous, free of human control. Currently with drones, a human makes the decision whether to launch the Hellfire missile, but um, they're trying to develop autonomous drones um, which will make their own decisions about whether or not to kill you. Um, my son, who's a PhD candidate in electrical engineering, assures me that this development is a couple decades down the road. He keeps saying, Dad, you'll be dead by the time they do this, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> oh, that's good. reassuring, right? right. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's the, opinion, that's the opinion of the youth. Right. However, the, the work has begun. Back in 2009, Ronald Arkin, a professor at Georgia Tech, wrote a book entitled Governing Lethal Behavior in Autonomous Robots in which he documented his work on code that would program the laws of war and the rules of engagement into robotic brains, a move which he claimed which would make them more moral than fallible human beings in making the decision where to kill. He begins his acknowledgment section by saying, quote, first my thanks to God and Jesus Christ for the will, ability, and calling to complete this work, unquote. It was, of course, also under government contract. Um, anyway, resistance to drones. God bless America. Mm -hmm. Well, if they built Thou Shalt Not Kill into it, that could help. Well, <laughs> if they simply used, <laughs> as many people say, as they, if they simply used Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. Oh, yeah. Um, but they're... What is they, that? Three Laws of he's, Robotics? The three law, oh, Isaac Asimov wrote a series of books about robots back in the 60s, and he... He had, I, I'm not sure if I can remember them, but the I can. Go ahead. A robot must not uh, harm a human being or through an action allow a human Indeed. being to be harmed. It's assuming that the robot is not, is, there's no barrier to prevent the robot from watching it happen. Okay. The second law is that a robot must obey orders <laughs> as long as it doesn't conflict with the first and um, self-preservation is actually the third law. The robot right. must That's protect its right. own existence as long as it doesn't interfere, interfere with, with the first or second law. So, I was thinking of giving a talk to the Richard Russell Society. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. 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 If only they kept this. What do you have a if you have a misbehaving robot huh? like like Hal? You know, and you know. Space Odyssey 2001. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, I mean, robots. And one thing that my son did say is that probably autonomous killer robots on the ground won't be the first the, because it's, 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 it's a much more difficult programming problem. But ones in the air are probably the, one, the ones that will be, e it will be easier to... Um, to program autonomous flying drones than autonomous land-based robots, if, if that's any, if that reassures you as well. Carrie, how do you, how do you how do intercept the robots? That, what? How do you intercept them if they're coming? If they're coming to the United States, apparently we have ways of intercepting. But what about over there? Why aren't there ways of intercepting them? Well, I mean, they they can. At, at this point, they can be shot down. You know, um, they're, they're fairly slow flying, the ones that we've got currently aren't jets, they're propeller driven, um, but they, they can fly fairly high, so you know, if you have Stinger, Stinger missiles, you can probably bring them, you know, they, they haven't been brought down, they've also crashed a lot, although the Air Force claims that their, that their crash rate is about the same as for manned aircraft at the same stage in development. 
but I'm not sure that I told. Yeah, they're the same ones who told us that that um, right. Hancock right. is in Pakistan Massachusetts. If they, if Pakistan, if they wanted to and they had the will to, probably would, could remove, you know, drones from their airspace. Uh, it's a more of a political game. Well, it, it is, and the, the politics seem to have shifted to the point that we're not. Uh, we don't seem to be sending drone strikes in, although. You know, given the way, the realities of war, I'm not sure that the that the Pentagon flyers who are flying supposedly in Afghanistan aren't moving over the border into Pakistan at times. But um, but there's been no reports of that in in all of 2014 so far. Well, wasn't there some kind of understanding of our government with Pakistani government that they would allow us to to use drones? so long as we went after people that they wanted us to take out in addition to the people that we wanted to take out? Yeah, but that was, that I think was before the most recent elections and it's, it's I haven't heard definitively, well, but I do but know I that they have that's stopped. that's why the decrease, because of the recent elections. Oh, I, I think it is. Yeah. I, th I think it's that and, and maybe they're picking up on the, the depth of the, the discontent in yeah. Pakistan yeah. Um, over that. Are drones legal in here for, for, used for surveillance only? Um, good question. It probably depends on which country you're talking about. So in, within the U.S.? Uh, within the U.S. Um, I suspect that the law hasn't fully developed on that, um, and, and I haven't really what researched the you know, the surveillance law. Um, Maybe some of your organizations uh, around the country have contacts within, for instance, uh, the part of the FBI that is for mostly for investigating such things. Um, Intel, co-Intel Pro? Mm-hmm. And the FBI, it's, it's, according to Ward Churchill's book, um, the main purposes of co-Intel Pro are to, are to get rid of the, the leaders, really, of the Black Power Movement, the Latin America Solidarity Movement, the Native American Movement, and uh, well, the Latin, Latin American Solidarity Movement was after COINTELPRO officially ended, so that was the continuation under another name. Has it really ended? We don't know. Well, no, we don't know. We don't know, and we only knew about COINTELPRO program, the COINTELPRO program, because of those uh, the burglars that hit the media. Pennsylvania FBI office. Uh, there's that great book uh, called *The Burglary* that just that just came out. Um, where for for all the it was I think '68 that that this group um, organized a burg the first burglary of the FBI offices, and, and that was they and they took out all the documents and uh, and released them to reporters, and that was the first time that the word COINTELPRO got heard and, and that and and they had a lot of information about the targets in the Philadelphia area um, and nobody knew until this book came out who had done it uh, who who had organized this because they had such a pact of secrecy and, and nobody talked until finally this the woman who wrote the book was one of the reporters they'd released the documents to and she had a couple suspicions, and she finally got several of the people to admit that they that they had done it long after the statute of limitations had, had worn out. And even um, well-known people in the peace movement didn't know. And, you know, um, the it it occurred just before the Camden Twenty Eight that that and um, that Bob Good was involved in, and one of the reasons why they did the entrapment of the Camden 28 was that they were convinced that the FBI was convinced that John Grady who was the organizer of the Camden 28 had also organized the burglary of the media Pennsylvania FBI office and that's what they really wanted to get him on but it turns out he had nothing to do with that um, that, that it was a, a different group that even some of the people in the peace movement didn't even suspect that, that they would have done it. But uh, So it's an interesting story, and it really reveals a lot about um, 
the COINTEL program. I'm sorry, we got a little. So, sometime I'll tell you about some friends of ours who've been, who were assassinated. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if it was COINTEL Pro. It had to do with the Black Power Movement and the, communi the communication center in Boston. Oh, I think, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I, I remember you telling my class about that oh, once a little yeah. bit ago. Yes, yeah. Did anybody in your class pay attention? <laughs> well, if I hadn't put them to sleep already, I think they might, <laughs> a few of them might have, yes. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, the future is looking very grim, but one, one of the things that does give me hope is, is the fact that resistance to drones is growing. Um, it started, the, the resistance really started in April of 2009 at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, which I think was the first military drone control center when 14 people were uh, were arrested for trying to go on to Creech Air Force Base. Um, and, they, <clears throat> and they had a trial. And then, uh, as I said, the last resistance, the latest resistance was yesterday um, when Kathy Kelly and Georgia Walker were, were arrested out of Whiteman Air Force Base. Um, the resistance to drones has been spreading both in the United States and internationally. There's been resistance uh, at General Atomics, which is the manufacturer of the Predator and Reaper drones out in Southern California, um, at CIA headquarters in Langley, at Johns Hopkins University, where they have some major uh, drone research going on, and you know, in particular at Creech and Hancock and, uh, and Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Um, at Hancock, we've had a, a series of actions. We've had at least we've had probably seven or eight actions now in which people have been arrested. Um, we, we go to a small town court in DeWitt, New York, where um, there are two judges who are both part-timers, Judge Gideon and Judge Jokel. Um, they're getting very tired of us, and we're really... We're tying up. This is a small town court that's used to dealing with shoplifting and, and drunk driving. And uh, at, at first, Judge Gideon was very interested and let us use, uh, in the Hancock 38 trial, uh, let us bring in uh, an international law argument. And we were allowed to bring in Ramsey Clark for an evening to testify. And it was a, it was a wonderful, he still found us guilty, but it was a wonderful trial. Um, it, the next year, we it, again on Earth Day has been the traditional day for trying to do major resistance there. Um, we were walking to the base and were arrested as we were walking to the base for parading without a permit. Um, it caught everybody by surprise once we passed the town boundary of, of DeWitt, and for a while the, the police herded everybody into, into a parking lot and told the people who weren't at all planning to get arrested, including one of my students, that if you try to leave, we're going to arrest you. We're going to charge you with you know, resisting arrest as well as parading without a permit. And finally, they negotiated letting some people go and then arrested a bunch of us. And uh, But then that one was so bogus that the, the Onondaga County District Attorney turned it back to the uh, attorney for the town of DeWitt to prosecute us, and they decided to drop, just drop the charges, because that one was pretty bogus. And then uh, there were several actions after that. What they started to do then, and, and I think this is worth talking about a little bit, is to issue us orders of protection um, the base commander. to protect the base commander. Yes. and. If I can find it, I'll uh, somewhere here. I've got a copy of it. Uh, bas basically, they uh, 